With a program on modern approaches to vascular surgery, this is Audio Digest Surgery, Volume 16, Number 12, for the week of June 25th, 1969. During this coming hour, you'll hear an analysis of vascular surgery in trauma and in cancer, a panel discussion on various problems in vascular surgery, experiences on the prevention of pulmonary emboli by partial occlusion of the inferior vena cava, and an abstract of note from the current surgical literature. Guest participants on this program, recorded at the recent annual meeting of the Ogden Surgical Society, include Ralph A. Detterling, Jr. of Tufts University School of Medicine, Boston, William H. Moritz of the Medical College of Georgia, Augusta, Alton Oxner of the Oxner Medical Foundation, New Orleans, and Dwight Parkinson of the University of Manitoba Faculty of Medicine in Winnipeg. To begin, Dr. Detterling elucidates several pertinent aspects of vascular surgery in trauma and in cancer. The type of injury that you encounter that require any kind of surgical consideration are, as you might expect, transection of a vessel, the tangential opening of a vessel, and then a contusion. Now, the first two don't require much discussion. A major vessel that's transected may surprise you and not bleeding too seriously, even a vessel the size of a femoral artery in a young person, say a butcher's assistant who cuts himself. There's a retraction of the vessel, the adventitia closes down, a clot forms because of the resistant tissue pressures, and you may not have an exsanguinating hemorrhage. On the other hand, a tangential wound does not allow the retraction, and you may get very serious bleeding, and unless there are proper measures taken by the ambulance attendants or whoever is rendering first aid, you can have a serious problem on your hand from a much less impressive tangential wound. The contusion is an interesting thing because we see it mostly, at least at the city hospital where there are 8,000 fractures and sprains a year, in relationship to fractures and dislocations. And not because of being hit in the arm or leg with a baseball bat or something else of that sort. In the use of high velocity missiles, either wartime or in peacetime hunting, uh, you can have a tremendous amount of vascular injury unrecognized by the cavitation behind the passage of a missile. And the tissue vibrations there can be such to destroy the endothelium and you end up with a thrombosis and of course all of the problems that can follow depending where the particular vessel is. And this deserves attention and often may require excision and grafting in contrast to what seems to be more obviously serious injuries, the two types we mentioned before. Now the sequelae, again, are pretty evident. The thrombosis and possible gangrene, aneurysm formation, severe spasm, and AV fistula are among those, of course, that you'd be concerned about and try to prevent. The spasm situation has always been something that's been of interest to me and I think has been perhaps overemphasized in the old literature where they used to feel that spasm frequently could produce enough ischemia to lead to gangrene. I rather believe that this is quite uncommon and I also believe that severe spasm sustained for any period of time is uncommon unless you have a continued initiating source such as the fracture fragment a dislocation or a foreign body. Now in controlling that kind of spasm, a topical application is the most effective. Although there have been many times advice given to use a 60 milligrams of papaverin, intramuscularly or something of this type, uh, most people who have attempted to deal with the local spasm problem have felt that nothing less than two and a half percent papaverin topically would do anything, and many people have been very disappointed with this. Now, Shires seemed to feel that one or two percent xylocaine or two and a half percent papaverin was pretty good, and our own experience has not been that supportive. So that we've been more inclined to go along with mustard and some of the others who have felt that mechanical distension of the vessel sometimes is the most effective, and so with soft occlusion of the vessel segment, preferably not with an instrument, we have injected material into the segment of artery, either saline or one of the agents like papaverin, and distended it. Dr. Griska in our department has even had a few occasions in which he did an arteriotomy and distended the vessel with a hemostat and then put a vein patch on it. Now these are not common things, but 
I think if you're going to face the problem of spasm, then it ought to be done effectively. A sympathectomy or block is more commonly a thing that's probably used as an adjunct. And in Shire's cases, 50% of his group had sympathectomy or block. Our own group are much less commonly than that. Now, the major factors in trying to get some attention to the patient, of course, is early recognition of arterial injury. And this may not be too easy if the patient has not exsanguinated, and particularly if there's multiple trauma. So that the local evidence of arterial injury is, is quite important to seek out, and any general evidence of hemorrhage, occult hemorrhage with the fast pulse rate, the lowered blood pressure, and pallor, and even uh, evidence of shock, I think is quite important to follow through and get to the diagnosis. So that the next thing would be the early definition of the extent and importance of the injury. And arteriography has been used quite a bit in this regard. I think it's only important to endorse what Lumpkin and Shires have said, that there are instances where there's a definite damage to a major artery where the arteriogram may not show the extravasation of contrast material, so that you cannot entirely put all of your chips on that particular procedure. The early corrective measures, I think, are perhaps the most important thing, with time in some areas being extremely important. The stab wound, and this can be a knife, an ice pick, or anything else, has been about 50% of most of the larger reported series. Among the others, gunshot, about one-third, and most of these are small caliber, so that you don't have a great deal of tissue damage. These would be 22 pistols most often, and then 25 and 32 caliber, perhaps next, unless the police are involved, in which case you've got 38 caliber. Blunt injuries, only about 5 to 10 percent. And as I said, most of these would be associated with some kind of orthopedic trauma. It's of interest that about half of the arterial injuries also had some major venous concomitant damage, and this should be recognized too. We've had a couple of rare instances with very elderly citizens falling against the bureau or stumbling against a table, fracturing a very calcified artery, and ending up with a very large hematoma of the thigh, which required evacuation. But this is sort of unusual. Now, the matter of grafts comes up, and I think that this is a very uncommon type of thing. It should be uncommon. In trying to go through the orthopedic experience in contrast to the general overall, there were some differences. That the incidence of gangrene in the blunt injury, this is the distorted vessel from pressure, outside pressure and stretching, that the trouble in those patients was much greater. Now, a lot of these did involve problems involving the arm joint, which was not a very good one to have involved with an extended period of ischemia. In the direct injuries, I think just a simple over and over suture ligature with fine arterial silk is the best. Shire has made some comparisons about everting versus uh, continuous, and that the reduction in the circumference is twice that with the averting as with the continuous suture, and we've used continuous suture for aortic as well as peripheral arterial repairs now for some 10 or 12 years. In any instance, the needs of grafts, regardless of the cause of vascular injury, has been less than 10 percent. It was interesting in the group from Dallas, which went back some years, that he had 30 grafts, and 20 of these were synthetic, two were vein, and eight were homologous. In our New York experience, before I went to Boston in 1959, we had mostly homologous and vein grafts, but in Boston we have had mostly vein grafts at the city hospital. And part of the reason there has been that we've had a high infection rate in elective reconstruction, so that we feel that there'd be much greater safety in using a vein, in view of the fact, too, that with penetrating injuries you've got a contaminated field. We've also had the feeling that where flexion areas were involved, such as the knee and groin, that the vein was probably more likely to stay patent longer. And then the matter of caliber of the vessel also plays some role. I basically am still quite satisfied with the synthetic grafts 
in major arteries, but I would certainly feel in this particular circumstance that probably there's more to be said for the uh, vein graft than any other. Um, fasciotomy has come in for some consideration, and in, in Shire's group, there was 35% of their patients that had fasciotomy. We have far fewer than that that have at least primary fasciotomy. And in this instance, there are some vertical incisions to release the compartments, either the anterior tibial or the medial compartment. And his indications for this, I would think we could probably agree with. It was a delay of several hours before definitive therapy could be provided. A patient that was in prolonged shock or at least very poor perfusion of the extremity. The presence of massive swelling, and we certainly would agree with that one. A combination of arterial and venous injury, and we have usually not considered that an out-and-out -out indication. And a massive associated soft tissue injury, which I think we would probably agree. So fasciotomy, I think, would probably remain in the sphere of personal judgment if you were taking care of an extremity problem. And then lastly, what the role of anticoagulants should be. And in most of these instances, unless you had a problem of a contusion that did not lead to grafting or other corrective measures, we probably would not feel that heparin was an important adjunct, as most of these patients have pretty good vascular system except for the site of injury. There's not much that we will say actually with the tumor group. It's not too frequent that you really have to consider major arterial replacement in unblock massive cancer surgery. It's been shown surprisingly how many vessels can be ligated with impunity and at times this has included the superior mesenteric artery and the portal vein and others. But I do think that it's appropriate that if you do have to sacrifice a major vessel that you do do it and not feel that the artery poses a deterrent to what you'd be satisfied with adequate cancer surgery, whether it's head and neck or whether it's pelvic or what, because you do have vessels that are able to be used to substitute in the abdomen and in the chest. We regularly prefer synthetic materials. The only exception being is if you're in an infected bed, we'd be inclined not to use any synthetic because you're asking for trouble. But on one occasion, I've been able to use the femoral artery of a patient and use that for iliac and aortic reconstruction and then use the patient's own saphenous vein in the leg for a graft there. And this has worked perfectly well. And Jack Wiley has brought attention to the use of autogenous arterial grafts into the iliac region from the leg well before we did it ourselves. Now Dr. Detterling joins William H. Moritz, Alton Oxner, and Dwight Parkinson in a panel discussion of several important problems in vascular surgery. Dr. Oxner serving as panel moderator, opens the discussion with these words. I've asked each of the panelists to say a few words and then have questions and pick their brains. Now, Dr. Parkinson, will you please lead off? We depend tremendously on stereoscopic angiography, and I think this is the biggest advance that we have available to us. And this represents 10 years of pleading with the x-ray people to get simultaneous biplane stereoscopic angiography, which they've finally developed for us. This means that with one injection, we have AP and lateral stereoscopic films. The tubes fire alternately. Its speeds go up to about as fast as a cassette changer can change it. I don't suppose anywhere else in the body is three-dimensional orientation of the vessels as important. Anywhere else you can sort of follow tissue planes along or pack and go somewhere else, but any surgeon, neurosurgeon who hasn't used this, I'm sure would want to once he has had the advantages of it. Now to go up to the carotid cavernous fistula. This is the two cavernous carotids, the cavernous sinus, and the blood vessels that we have found and named and described connecting them. I think you have to realize now that there are two types of carotid fistula. In the one, the tear may be in the wall of the carotid itself, but in the other, one of these branches may be torn, and there's no amount of trapping of the carotid that's ever going to control the flow from the torn end distally. Now, operation transcavernously is quite feasible. We've done it. It's a pure straight anatomical dissection once you know where you are. But 
Every operation designed for this fistula, the carotid has been sacrificed. And we're convinced in the future, and certainly our next case, if it doesn't come to us with a carotid already ligated, the procedure of choice is going to be to go in there directly and deal with the fistula, if possible, and preserve the carotid in the ophthalmic artery. I'm sure that that will be the procedure of choice from now on. Bill, I'd like to ask a question. Dr. Parkinson said something, I think, that surprised me. Didn't you make a statement that the internal carotid artery went through a vein, was within a vein? You mean within the venous blood, not uh, lined with endothelium on the outside? Now that's a good question. The cavernous sinus has never really been studied very much. The cavernous carotid artery lies within the cavernous sinus. And there's some people who believe the cavernous sinus is a plexus of veins, and others that it's a big venous channel, just like your sagittal sinus. But there is intima on the surface of the carotid. On the outside? Yes, on the outside of the carotid, where it goes through the cavernous sinus. Oh, yes, there's no place where blood runs against an adventitia. I just thought you'd found something new. I but a lot of the trabeculae that have been called trabeculae in the cavernous sinus are these little arteries. They have practically no wall except their own endema. The little arteries that we discovered or found. And, uh, gee, they're, they're not little. When they're full of blood, they're pretty good size. They're all lumen. Now we'll have Ralph talk to us. We'll get right into talking about aortic aneurysms, and because of the time limitation, I'll make my comments only in relationship to the infrarenal variety. As you'd expect, the great majority of these are from atherosclerosis, and we are seeing, at least in America, a tremendous movement into younger age groups. This is in part, I suspect, because of the dietary nature, which was studied sometime after the war, when they were comparing the incidence of atherosclerosis in Denmark and other occupied countries where they had a very significant drop-off in butter fat. I think this is perhaps some reason for it, and there's undoubtedly some genetic aspects and others that we can't determine, but the greatest bulk of patients do have atherosclerosis as the problem, and that's important because the deaths of the survivors coming through aortic resection most often are due to further effects of the atherosclerosis as it affects other systems. We don't feel generally that the aortic aneurysm needs therapy if it is, say, less than five or six centimeters because it is a major operation. And although most of the statistics would support a mortality in the range of six and a half to 15 percent, with 10 being about what we'd expect for the elective resection in a patient in good condition, when the rupture has taken place, then it's a tremendously different situation. And so I think the one thing that comes up is to what you do with a patient who's comfortable and yet who has an aneurysm. And we feel rather aggressive about it, assuming that he can stand the operation. So that I don't like to have people feel they should wait until there's a backache or until there's some kind of an evidence of enlargement of the aneurysm, although these are certain definite indications for surgery to be undertaken. And we have seen patients under orthopedic care, even in a traction frame with hip pain, when it was due to an expanding aneurysm. And one way that you can check this is with the lateral lumbar film, because most often these aneurysms are sufficiently calcific that you can get pretty accurate measurements if you're going to follow the patient for a bit. It's important to appreciate what kind of complications the patient gets into. And of course, the most serious one is the hemorrhage. Most often there's a tear just below the renals at the beginning of the sac on the left posteriorly, which is most often where the rupture is. And if you get in there quickly, you can either use an aortic compressor, which is a horseshoe-like affair that you can put across the vertebral bodies or you can actually get a clamp. Sometimes the rupture actually dissects the tissue so it's quicker and easier to get in there than an elective case and secure the bleeding and then go ahead and do the resection. A less common affair, there's a rupture into the duodenum as it crosses the aorta and these are usually fatal. We brought up something today about massive upper GI hemorrhage, but most often these don't 
allow that much time to be taken. They're usually uh, rather horrendous, although there have been a few survive. It's not too customary. An equally serious thing is a rupture into the vena cava. And here, as you'd expect, there are very, very significant hemodynamic changes with a markedly lowered diastolic pressure, a machinery murmur over the belly or the back, and changes in the electrocardiogram showing right strain so that you move right along with such a patient. And most of these you can salvage if they are brought right to the hospital. And we had one actually have this happen while he was in the hospital. An unusual type of thing we, we've seen in the last couple of years with salmonella, an increasing problem with major vessel aneurysms. So the mycotic aneurysms are not common, but we've seen several in the last two years that have had salmonella as the basis. So it's just important to keep your eye out. Now, most of the repairs, any of the synthetic grafts are perfectly fine in the aorta. We usually do an end-to-end -end and get our end-to-end -end down below or end-to-side if the lumen isn't too good, get the graft open and then finish the second anastomosis, allowing retrograde blood flow to get the air out and then usually reperitonealize the posterior portion of the peritoneum. I wanted to ask Dr. Dillerlin a question about what is your use of aortography in the diagnosis and treatment of aortic aneurysms? We went through an early period after Fred Wagner kind of reactivated interest in 46 in this country in aortography. And despite the horrible media that we started out with, 80% sodium iodide, we happily soon got over into neo packs and then, as you know, more and more people were doing aortography and troubles occurred and there were suits. So that for a period, I would guess, of almost oh, six or seven years at least, I practically never did any aortography in aortic aneurysm patients. We did do in the occlusive disease group because we wanted to not only plot it out and see what the future progress would be, but do the proper procedure for the person. In the last two or three years, there's been a very definite supportive feeling in, in our own group, and it seems to be shared by others, to do more vascular plotting of a patient who comes in with very significant disease, whether it's aneurysmal, occlusive, or the occasional combination. And one of the reasons that we have done this is that we encountered a few patients who had significant unilateral a partially occlusive disease of one renal artery without hypertension. And being there and ordinarily not trying to feel the renal arteries if you're doing an aortectomy, we then got interested in trying to determine just what degree of disease there might be in the abdominal viscera. And our radiologists with their facile uh, catheter technique could get you anything you wanted. So that they did get us a celiac axis, perimesenteric renal, an aortic picture. Then extending the studies to four vessel ones in the head for extracranial occlusive disease and getting interested in coronary work, there has been, I think, a further refinement, not only of the ability of the people doing it, but further improvement in the contrast media that's used. We keep an eye on how long they keep patients tied up because some of the radiologists lose a little sense of timing with patients and we also keep a close eye on what the complication rate is which in our institution has been remarkably low. We do now I would guess in perhaps three quarters of the patients with aortic aneurysms get an aortogram not so much to confirm the fact it's there but to try and determine what the state of the vessels are elsewhere. Dr. Parkinson wants to ask a question. In the thoracic graphs that you've done, the high ones, have you had any trouble with sacrificing intercostals and having cord dysfunction? Very well put. We have indeed seen difficulties with nervous system dysfunction in patients that have had interruption and grafting of the thoracic aorta. As a matter of fact, with coarctation, where you don't have a very tight stenosis and a tremendous collateral, you can run into this danger if you hold off the aorta longer than perhaps a half hour or 45 minutes. And Crawford had said you could do it in the human for a half hour, and in one boy that had trouble with a ductus, 17-year-old boy, we had transient trouble with 
just 20 minutes. It's a variable thing, not only the time that you can hold off the aorta, but the level at which the supply of the anterior spinal comes is customarily, we think of it in the lower two dorsal levels. And we've had several instances with very extensive aortic aneurysms where we have either in the old days of wrapping completely taken down all of the intercostals from the diaphragm all the way up and wrapped the whole thing or subsequently done grafting in these patients and not had any trouble. And conversely, in two patients that we had done more limited resections uh, at a higher level, uh, paraplegia resulted. And we published a paper in Annals of Surgery of two cases that Dr. Nabseth and Dr. Merez were involved in where there was paraplegia from lumbar supply to the anterior spinal that followed the resection of aortic aneurysm below the renal artery, which is, I think, quite uncommon. Now, we've tried to do protective things in any of these patients. They have been all kinds, the external shunt, the internal shunt, the use of hypothermia, and so forth. And I think that probably the anatomical location is the one main determinant. And the simplest thing that we have done is a combination of mild hypothermia the use of low molecular dextran to keep the blood as freely flowing as possible under static conditions in the microcirculation, and the use of the atriofemoral bypass, which does assure very good retrograde perfusion mean pressures. So I think this is perhaps the best you can do. I'd like to hear his views on that. Regarding the circulation of the cord, it's entirely correct, of course, that it's variable, and that's where the trouble lies, I'm sure, in these grafts. Several years ago, we used to see statistics published on the percentage of hemiplegias you got if you tied off one carotid. Of course, you got 100% hemiplegia if that was the only supply to that hemisphere. And people were not doing angiography with contralateral studies in those days. Unless you do something really dreadful, you'll get no hemiplegia a person has a good anterior communicating and or a good posterior communicating. I'm certain that you're going to have to start doing similar studies. Incidentally, the Matas test was not always reliable, although it was a magnificent concept. We have done several thoracic aortograms to see arteriovenous malformations of the cord and with stereoscopic view, plugging again for stereoscopic views, not just biplane. You can see the circulation of the cord very well, and in many individuals there'll be one artery that almost exclusively supplies several segments of the cord. And I think that would be very worthwhile knowing in some of these cases. You might be able to save that artery in some instances. Excuse me, gentlemen, momentarily, to say that this doctor concludes side A of this program. On side B, the panel resumes their discussion of problems in vascular surgery, Heard by simply reversing the two reels, or cassette, on your tape recorder. This is Side B, Audio Digest Surgery, Volume 16, Number 12, continuing a program on modern approaches to vascular surgery. Resuming our panel discussion of problems in vascular surgery, once again, our panel moderator, Dr. Alton Oxner. Now we'll hear from Bill Moritz. I thought I'd confine my remarks to a few words about the venous side of the vascular system and just mention a couple of things that are of some importance. Then the question of doing thrombectomies for patients with acute thrombophlebitis, particularly the more severe form that goes by the common name of phlegmasia cerulea dolens, there is quite a question, I think, as to whether or not the patients respond better to thrombectomy than they do with simply elevation, heparinization, and non-operative therapy. And I think the controversy probably should be decided upon on the basis of several considerations. First is, which method of treatment would be associated with a higher incidence of thromboembolism? I think in that one category that there probably is very little difference. My own impression, which is not too firm, is that the treatment of thrombectomy is more often associated with pulmonary emboli than treatment by pure heparin elevation and compression bandages. So that from the standpoint of embolization alone, there probably is little choice between the two, but what little choice there is probably would favor the non-operative treatment. Second consideration would be the frequency with which gangrene developed in the very marked cases of phlegmasia cerulea dolens following the two forms of treatment. 
And there, at least in my opinion, I don't think it makes much difference. From the standpoint of the development of gangrene, I think that the amount of gangrene that will develop is determined prior to the time you see the patient. If the patient has necrosis at the time you see them, then he's going to have some gangrene whether you do a thrombectomy or not. If he doesn't have necrosis, I don't think that they'll have gangrene, at least not commonly, even if you just treat them by heparinization, elevation, and compression. And the third consideration I think that we should give thought of in reference to whether or not we should do early thrombectomies in these patients has to do with the seriousness of the post phlebitic sequelae that develop following the two forms of treatment. The early reports following thrombectomy were quite glowing, but I think rather shortly thereafter, there was considerable question as to how much good this actually was doing. And the question was brought up because of the rather common observation that post-operative venograms usually showed that the vein which had been opened by thrombectomy had, in spite of early heparinization and late anticoagulants, had become reocluded. Now, there are series that report a very high incidence of reocclusion. There are other series that show a much less high incidence of reocclusion, but still a significant amount of reocclusion. So I think the early venographic response shed considerable doubt on the very glowing reports, early reports of thrombectomy. The time, I don't believe, has been sufficient yet to know by clinical experience which of the two methods will give the best extremity after a long period of time. It's been our observation that the earliest subsidence of swelling and so on is perhaps not quite as dramatic, but almost as dramatic with prompt heparinization as it is with thrombectomy. So at the present time, in this one particular area, it would seem to me that most of the evidence at this time would be a little bit in favor of the non-operative treatment rather than the thrombectomy, which a couple of years ago, I think, would certainly have been different had you asked a number of people. And I think if we asked several on this panel, it might be different now. I do disagree to a certain extent, Bill. In this respect, I agree with you that there are certain cases of Lake Mesa that do very well conservatively. But it is a dangerous disease, and in many instances that we felt that it is necessary to do a thrombectomy. But I agree with you that the complications after thrombectomy are a lot higher than most people believe. And this is one of the reasons why I feel that thrombectomy for the garden variety of venous thrombosis routinely is not desirable. I think that interruption of the cava or superficial pheromal, I prefer the cava, is preferable because in the hands of a, an accomplished vascular surgeon, I think one can get by with thrombectomy. But I've seen, I know three patients who died because thrombectomy was done by surgeons who were not capable of doing a vascular operation and they died, whereas they would have lived had they simply put a ligature in or put a clip on. And I think that the emphasis on thrombectomy has greatly been overemphasized. That would be true, don't you think, in spite of the study by phlebography and the possibility of using that then to allow you to put a Fogarty catheter up to block off the vena cava. In spite of those things, uh, well, those things are dangerous in themselves. So I think it would probably not allow you to safely choose which patients you might treat one way and which one's the other. The one thing I would like to emphasize is that those that include doing something more than ligation of the cava, such as Bill does, many of them start out with the premise, and this isn't true of Bill, but many of them do start out with the premise that the reason they're advocating this is because of the disabling sequelae after cava ligation. Now, I take exception to that because unless they're swelling before you do the ligation, and if you will compress the extremities from the toes to the groin, and in the thigh you must use an adhesive elastic because of the conical shape of the thigh, and mobilize the patient, they will not get a swelling of their leg. Now, this I think must be emphasized. We've done table ligation in over 400 cases, and we've, we're getting all of our patients back and we have yet to have a patient who is disabled at all. 
We have some that have some swelling, but the sequelae have been surprisingly low, and we have a very long follow-up on it. I believe that if one has plebothrombosis, and I don't think one should wait until they have the embolism. If you wait until they have another one, how do you know the next one isn't going to be the fatal one? And I feel the same way about pulmonary embolism. An individual who has plebothrombosis and a potential candidate for pulmonary embolism, it is so simple to put a ligature on the venous system or a grid proximal to the clot. I don't believe the vein ligation should be done prophylactically, but I think it is a life-saving procedure, and, and I think the simplest thing that can be done is the thing that should be done. And even the ordinary garden variety surgeon as I am can put a ligature on, whereas putting the grid on, or the clip isn't so hazardous, but certainly putting the grid with the sutures, I think is making it more difficult. We had not too energetic an effort at evaluating ligature and the clip or fenestration and could not be convinced that there was a significant difference. Our greatest trouble afterwards came in any group that had had significant venous difficulties beforehand, as you'd expect, and in the group that had significant cardiac disease. But over and above that, there wasn't anything that we could really pinned down as being terribly superior, and we did give up the thrombectomy, unless it appeared to be really an attractive thing to do in the individual case after you had ligated. There seemed to be some evidence that we couldn't dispute that in the further formation of collateral or in the further development of clot, that if you had clot after you did the interruption that you could remove, this might be worthwhile, but we have not been aggressive. I think that we were talking about pulmonary embolism and venous thrombosis. It must be emphasized, although it is increasing, a great deal can be done to prevent it from occurring in prophylaxis, such as mobilization of the extremity, head down position when it's possible, and applying heat. If there's ever a patient who is a candidate for phlebothrombosis, it's the individual who has a fractured femur because one has the trauma, which results in a, an increase in the clotting tendency and the immobilization, so that the stage is set for it. And yet we've observed that those patients with a femoral fracture treated by immobilization in plaster had a very low incidence of venous thrombosis, whereas the individuals with the same type of fracture but treated with extension in which the immobilization was less marked, if anything, the incidence of venous thrombosis was high. I was in Japan about two years ago, and this observation was made there. I visited our Navy hospital at Yokosuka, where they treated all their patients with traction. And the incidence of venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism was quite high. In one of the Army hospitals, where these femoral fractures were treated by extension, but with plaster, it was low. Now, the reason, I think, is that the plaster exerts an insulating effect, retaining the heat of the extremity, and it has the same effect as increasing the heat, which results in hyperemia, and there's a visa tergo, an increased visa tergo, and the arterial blood supply is increased, and therefore the venous blood supply is increased. I think it's the only explanation. Thank you, panel. Now Dr. Moritz takes up another important area of vascular surgery, the prevention of pulmonary emboli by partial occlusion of the inferior vena cava. Here he is. It's estimated that one out of 100 operations will be associated with some form of intravenous thrombosis in the postoperative period. And that if you confine that to major operations, the incident rises to five or six out of 100. Of these that develop venous thrombosis, five to 10% will develop a pulmonary embolus. And of those, about one third will die. So it is of considerable importance. There are predisposing factors with which you're all familiar, primarily venous stasis, about which we can do something, abnormal vein walls, which we can't do very much about, and the hypercoagulability of the blood, which is a necessary accompaniment of surgery and of certain other conditions which we can do something about. Some of the things that we can do in order to help prevent the occurrence of venous thrombosis, we can do things specifically to try to accelerate the blood flow. 
particularly in the lower extremities. The compression of our leg uh, bandages, exercises in bed and early ambulation. It's probable that if we're really worried about a patient, we should start the elastic support prior to the time of surgery, since many of the later episodes probably have their origin during surgery. We can also avoid those things, particularly in the post-operative period, which are known to slow up the circulation, such as abdominal distension by appropriate nasogastric suction, avoid excessive degrees of dehydration, and avoid certain positions, such as the jackknife position, which no longer is used uh, hardly ever, which would, if used, tend to promote venous stasis. Actually, the diagnosis of venous thrombosis is first made usually by the occurrence of a pulmonary embolus manifested by the typical chest pain, cyanosis, dyspnea, and tachycardia. X-rays, as you know, initially are likely to be perfectly normal, and only one, two, or three days later would it show the characteristic signs. There are only two fairly certain ways to diagnose it with certainty. One is by autopsy, and a more preferable way is by pulmonary arteriography. All other tests leave considerable to be desired from the standpoint of accuracy. Even the scans show a fair number of false positives. Now, when a patient has venous thrombosis manifested by a pulmonary embolus, then certainly treatment is indicated. We would all agree that prophylaxis is best, and from the standpoint of actually attacking the problem with significance, then much better ways to prevent it really represent the only reasonable approach. But in spite of the best efforts so far, at least, it does occur. And when it occurs, then treatment is indicated. There is very little disagreement with the general feeling that in almost all patients, the treatment of choice is immediate anticoagulation by heparin. There is some question as to dextran and its effectiveness, and it might well be that it will be as effective, but at the moment, we're certainly more convinced about the effectiveness of heparin, and we would insist that Coumadin or Dicumarol does not fulfill this role in an acceptable manner for the early treatment of patient with a pulmonary embolus. There are certain patients, however, who require or certainly justify the interruption of the vein, and these would be comprised primarily of those patients in whom anticoagulants are contraindicated strongly, those in whom anticoagulants are being used but have been unsuccessful in that another embolus has occurred, even though on full heparinization, and that group, which is becoming larger, in which the patient develops his pulmonary embolus while normally ambulatory. If we are to interrupt the vein to prevent the next pulmonary embolus, then there's pretty good agreement at the moment that this is preferably done at the level of the inferior vena cava. The question then arises as to the best method of interrupting the inferior vena cava. Certainly the method used longer and about wh with which there's been the greatest amount of experience is ligation of the inferior vena cava. There are certain difficulties, however, associated with the total occlusion of the vena cava, which we would like to avoid if we could, if we didn't sacrifice anything from the standpoint of effectiveness in preventing the embolus as reported by Dr. Dale in a series of 10 patients in whom he measured the pressure response to ligation. There's an immediate appreciable rise which does come down fairly rapidly and is only slightly increased beyond the first few uh, hours, actually, certainly the first few days. There must be a rapid development of collaterals or the patient will die. Collaterals, regardless of how adequate they appear, are never as physiologic as the normal pathway, which is the vena cava. Now, in order to narrow the cava enough to prevent the passage of a sizable embolus, and yet to not interfere with the blood flow, studies indicated that with a normal physiologic range of between 1,000 and 2,000 cc's per minute, and to maintain a normal pressure of less than 50 millimeters or five centimeters of water, it is possible to have that normal flow with no alteration in pressure if the clip has a gap of three, four, or five millimeters. If you make it smaller than that, then you get out of the physiologic range. So we did accept then the smallest lumen, which is three millimeters, which 
does not significantly interfere with the blood flow through the area as the ideal size of the gap in the clip. Some of the occluding devices that have been developed, the smooth clip, the serrated clip, another mechanism developed by Dr. Frank Spencer and Dr. Quattlebaum of making little compartments out of the cava by interrupted sutures five millimeters apart through the anterior and posterior vein walls. Another mechanism, the sieve, developed by DeWeese and Hunter, is a cross-hatching of a plastic suture through the vein wall, which will catch any sizable embolus. The smooth limb on one side and the serrated on the other, as developed by Adams and DeWeese of Rochester. The curved, smooth, and serrated clip. There are any number of possibilities that can be developed. And whether there is a particular advantage of one particular type of partial interruption over another remains to be seen. I do think that there's a marked advantage in not having to penetrate the wall of the vena cava and not having anything within the lumen of the vena cava. So that some device that's applied external to the vena cava, to my mind, would have many advantages over anything that required a suture in the vena cava or anything within it. We do think that when the clip is applied, it is exceedingly important, in my opinion, that when anything is done to the vena cava, the patient continue as soon as he can on anticoagulants, because nothing you do to the vena cava affects the primary problem of intravenous thrombosis. So our routine is, after applying the clip, to first put them on dextran for a period of two to three days, one unit daily. And then, unless heparin has been contraindicated, to restart the heparin for a period of five or six days, and then to put them on Coumadin and keep that on for another two to three months. It is important, I think, to prevent venous pathology by resuming as quickly as you can the anticoagulant therapy. Now, our experience is limited at this time to 72 patients, which we have accumulated in the course of about 13 years. So we don't do it really very, very often. Well, in this series of 72 patients, the indications for surgery were in 30 instances failure of anticoagulants, in six anticoagulants were contraindicated, in six the embolus occurred while the patient was normally ambulatory, and the fourth indication I think will probably become, I hope, the more important and the more commonly used indication for some means of interrupting vena cava of all. And that is the incidental application of a device during surgery for some other condition in which we have reason to fear the later postoperative development of difficulty within the veins that might lead to pulmonary emboli. In this particular series, 19 patients had the clip applied incidentally during laparotomy for other conditions because in their history they had had a history of previous pulmonary embolus. Nine had it applied because of other uh, venous disease, but no previous pulmonary emboli, and then two others. So a total of 72 patients had the clip applied. The early mortality is significant, but unrelated in almost all instances to the application of a clip. Most are due to the poor condition of the patient at the time. Some cardiovascular cause in five, three of which were myocardial infarctions, one was cerebral anoxia associated with a massive pulmonary embolus, a pulmonary embolectomy, and the failure to recover well after that procedure because of anoxia occurring during the embolectomy. The massive venous thrombosis is very discomforting. This was a patient who died some 28 days after having a clip applied, and at autopsy had massive thrombosis throughout the entire large venous system, except between the clip and the heart. She had also emboli in the lungs, and we could not tell whether any were fresh or whether they were all old. We could not be sure. This could have been a fatal pulmonary embolus after clip. But we've seen the same thing after total occlusion of the vena cava, and it's been reported by others. So I don't understand it. But in some patients, there is this tremendous tendency to clot, which apparently nothing you can do will prevent. The late mortality, none of these are related at all to the clip procedure or to the recurrence of embolism. Now, the two things that we would like to study specifically in comparing a partial occluding mechanism to total ligation to see whether one has advantage over the other. 
First, is their relative effectiveness in preventing recurrent emboli. And secondly, to try to compare them from the standpoint of undesirable sequelae from the standpoint of the lower extremities. Recurrent pulmonary emboli were suspected and probably occurred in five of these patients. One occurred on the fifth day, but he also had a coronary occlusion, which is probably more important. So that we don't list this as a fatality due to recurrence, but instead the coronary occlusion. The one I mentioned before, the massive venous thrombosis, occurred on the death on the 28th day. One occurred two and a half years after the operation and had pain and a compatible x-ray. One occurred three years after clipping and probably did have a small embolus. And one occurred 21 days after the clipping and probably represented a recurrence. Two others were suspected but proven not to have really by negative scan. Now this is the experience of other people using partially occluding mechanisms. Our series, five out of 72 probable recurrences, and four out of 62, two out of 20, it's already clipped four out of 104 and so on. Totaling them up, the average reported recurrence of pulmonary emboli after partially occluding mechanisms is 7%. The experience with ligation of the inferior vena cava, the more recent reports, Again, 2 out of 40, 4 out of 74, 4 out of 41, 9 out of 45, 3 out of 20, with an average of about 10% recurrent pulmonary emboli after ligation of the vena cava. So from the standpoint of effectiveness in preventing emboli, I think it compares favorably. Now, what about the fate of the extremities? 67 patients with 130 extremities were followed for periods up to 12 years. 94 of the extremities, not patients, had no ill effects observed after the operation. 47 had been normal before the clip, 47 had been abnormal before the clip, but they had had no progression of difficulty or had gotten better. 36 had become worse after the clip, and how they got worse, 24 had minimal amount of edema, 6 a moderate amount, and only one has developed ulceration. Recognizable phlebitis occurred in 11 patients, and 10 developed acute massive thrombosis at some time following the clipping procedure. The relationship between previous phlebitis and the development of leg sequelae and the occurrence of an, a proximal occlusion and the likelihood to develop subsequent difficulty from post syndrome. Recognizable phlebitis occurred almost exclusively in those which were pre-clipping already the site of phlebitis abnormal. And the presence or absence of proximal occlusion in the vena cava or iliac vein had relatively little significance from the standpoint of recognizable phlebitis. On the other hand, acute massive thrombosis did not occur except in those that had developed occluded proximal veins in either the inferior vena cava level or the iliac level. And it had no relationship essentially to the presence or absence of pre-existing phlebitis of the extremity. I think that the partially occluding mechanism is associated without any question with fewer leg sequelae than is total occlusion of the inferior vena cava. I think that if these become occluded, they do so only by having caught a thrombus. And I don't think that's true if you are speaking of the compartmentalization procedure where the plastic sutures are placed through the vein wall or in the sieve procedure where the sutures go inside the lumen of the vena cava. I think it's preferable to total ligation except in those patients with small septic emboli which demand ligation, particularly of the ovarian veins and probably of the vena cava as well. I think probably the most value, if any, of this concept of only partially occluding the vena cava will be in what we now call the coincidental application of this protective device during laparotomy for other conditions. I'm quite certain that you can apply a partially occluding clip to the vena cava with complete assurance that you will do no harm and that you might save the patient's life, that in the patient in whom you have reason to suspect that they're particularly prone to develop intravenous thrombosis with a probability then of pulmonary emboli, that it is a good safeguard to narrow the lumen so that nothing sizable can get through it. I tried to get Dr. Oxner not to go too much into this, and I told him that I was going to have the last word. I still say 
that partial occluding is better than total ligation for the inferior vena cava interruption. And to conclude this issue, here is a note of clinical interest from the current surgical literature. It's a common belief that extensive surgical procedures often cause serum enzyme elevations and thus make these determinations of little diagnostic value in the post-operative period. But Bethesda's John D. Hara and colleagues draw a different conclusion from their study of 56 patients undergoing major surgery. Prior to surgery, all patients had normal SGOT, SGPT, and LDH levels. In the first four post-operative days, eight of the 56 had slightly elevated serum enzymes, none high enough to suggest acute myocardial or pulmonary disease. Concomitant SGOT and LDH elevations, frequently seen in patients with myocardial disease, were not observed, and EKGs and X-rays showed no evidence of myocardial or pulmonary lesions. Other investigators report SGOT elevations after biopsy or manipulation of the liver, operations on the biliary tract, extensive trauma to skeletal muscle, thoracotomy, and prolonged anesthesia. But Dr. Hara and associates could not substantiate these findings. They report serum enzyme determinations can be useful diagnostic aids even in the early post-operative period. And with that item, we conclude this edition of Audio Digest Surgery. Our thanks to the participants and to the Ogden Surgical Society for cooperation in recording and disseminating this material. Audio Digest Surgery is produced twice each month by the Audio Digest Foundation, a nonprofit subsidiary of the California Medical Association. All rights are reserved. <laughs>